So, okay. All right. here I am. <laughs> I hope you all have had a happy Thanksgiving. We had turkey. So, I have done this sutta before, but I, something is telling me that I need to do it again. And this is sutta number 55, 59, excuse me. The many kinds of feeling. So, so I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pendika's Park. Then the carpenter, then the carpenter Panchakanga went to the venerable Udayan. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One? Three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One Householder. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One Venerable Udayan. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Feeling, uh, pleasant feeling and painful feeling. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. A second and third time, the Venerable Udayan stated his position. A second and a third time, the carpenter Panjakanga. He was always around uh, the monastery where uh, the Buddha stayed for 21 years. And he listened to all of the Dhamma talk. And then he would go back to work after the Dhamma talk was done. So he was pretty well uh, educated about the Buddha's talks. But the Venerable Udayan could not convince the carpenter Panchakanga, nor could the car carpenter Panchakanga convince the Venerable Udayan. So they went off and they were <clears throat> not happy with each other. How often does that happen when there's an agreement or a disagreement of something? How, does that, how often does that happen to you, especially the way politics are being run these days? A lot of people are very, very set in their ways instead of really listening to the other person they're thinking about the, uh, how the other person is wrong and that causes all kinds of problems so it does not lead to your happiness or the happiness of others it does not lead to your well-being or the well-being of others. So holding strong opinions kind of gets in the way of true Dhamma. You can listen, you can disagree, but you have to agree to disagree, not fight with each other and talk while the other person is talking and that sort of thing. It's listening quietly. Yes, you can agree or disagree, but don't interrupt. 
hear everything they have to say, then say, okay, I listened to you. I was respectful to you. Now please do the same courtesy for me. Okay. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him. He sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between Udayan and the carpenter Panjakanga. When he had finished, the Blessed One told Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it is actually a, pre a true presentation that the carpenter Panjakanga would not accept from Udayan. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayan would not accept from the par par carpenter Panjakanga. I have stated two kinds of feeling in one presentation. I have presented three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. What are the five kinds of feeling? The aggregates. Body, feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness. There's five kinds of feeling. I have stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. Six kinds of feeling or what? Each one of the sense doors. Now this is important if you're going to be paying attention to your meditation. You see, as soon as feeling starts to arise, right after that feeling, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, doesn't really matter, at one of the sense doors, there is craving that arises. Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. And the way you recognize that is by seeing that feeling of I like it or I don't like it. Seeing that tightness caused by that feeling. And this can get to be very, very subtle. So when you first see a feeling coming up, if you use the six R's right at that time, then the clinging, the habitual tendency, the birth, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair will not arise. In other words, you have purified your mind by using the six R's and using them properly. And the more you use the six R's, the more pure your mind becomes. The more your mind experiences equanimity the more your mind experiences true awareness and balance of mind. So using the six R's often, and uh, it's, it's hard to get this across to people, to use the six R's with your daily activities you have feeling come up at one of the sense doors. You see something that's unpleasant. You hear something that's unpleasant. What does your mind generally do? It gets involved in the craving. I don't like that. I don't want to be around that. I don't like that sight or sound. I don't like that taste. 
or smell. And once you have that come up, you're caught in the web of craving, in a trammel of craving. And who's causing that pain? That sound? That sight? That smell? Is that the cause of your upset and your dissatisfaction and your dislike? No. This is something that you're doing to yourself. You can't blame somebody else for saying something that you don't agree with or that you don't like. They're just using words. It's not that important, but you make it a big deal. And all of a sudden it turns into a mighty torrent of dislikes and dissatisfactions that you're taking personally. The more you can use the six R's with your daily activities, the easier it is to let go of your old habitual emotional tendency. The easier it is to open up and allow whatever is there to be there. It is all right for that sound or, or smell or taste or sight, whatever it is, it's all right for it to be there. It has to be all right because that's the truth. When it occurs, it's there. What do you do with the truth when it arises? Most people fight the truth. I don't like this. And you let your mind get into an emotional stick. You're making a big deal out of what somebody else said. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You're making it a big deal. You are causing yourself upset. But when you use the six R's properly, then your reaction, the way you act whenever something like this comes up, can turn into a response of equanimity and acceptance. It doesn't allow your mind to become hard when you use the six R's. It changes your perspective. It changes the way that you see the world around you. And this changes your personality and your idea of the world. I love people that talk about the Four Noble Truths like it's just something you, you just, it's something to mention and, and not understand. Because the Four Noble Truths is the key to changing your old ways of doing things and beginning a new, more awakened experience. So these six kinds of feeling are real important that as soon as you see any feeling come up and then there's that tightness, as soon as you recognize that there's a slight tightness happening in your head, in your mind, then you let it be there. You don't get involved with analyzing it. You don't get involved 
with trying to control it. You let it be there by itself and relax and smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Sometimes your object of meditation is simply a smile with your daily activities. When you begin to apply this kind of mindfulness, and I love the word mindfulness because so many people have no idea what they're talking about with mindfulness. When you apply this kind of mindfulness, in other words, your observation power to be able to recognize when this first starts to happen with your daily activities, it changes your entire life. Now, we have a lot of old habitual tendencies, not only from this life, but from other lifetimes. We always react, react react and that means act again just like you did before that's why we walk around being in a haze almost all the time we start to use mindfulness in the correct way of observing and then relaxing and letting it be we start to change the way we observe the world and we start seeing it as all part of an impersonal process. We start seeing it as a process instead of a psychological tool to use. And that's why when so many people come here for retreat, they leave as a different person. They're awake. A lot of people wake up at the center when they come and practice for 10 days. But the trick is you can't go home and then start acting the way you always acted. You have to allow and use the six R's without making big deals out of things that you don't, uh, this isn't, my philosophy is better than your philosophy. My ideas are better than your ideas. You have to truly take an interest in learning how to let go of the suffering. Not everything in life is suffering. There are some nice and pleasant things that happen. But there is suffering in life, and that's what we have to start recognizing. We have to start changing our perspective so we don't get so caught up in emotional upsets. So we can develop naturally having that balance of mind. So one of the reasons that I wanted to get into this many kinds of feeling is to state the importance of your being able to recognize a feeling when it arises. It doesn't just pop up. There are causes and effects for these things to arise. But what you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. The more 
clear you become with this kind of observation and use of the six R's, the more joy there is, there is more happiness there is in your life. And it happens all by itself. You start having a mind that's more accepting of everything. You start having a mind that's more allowable and not get into emotional snits. Taking responsibility for yourself and realize how much pain you cause yourself because of your old attachments, because of your old ways of thinking. Now, every now and then I listen to a Dhamma talk that somebody else gives and I catch my mind playing the game. Oh, that's not right. And it's okay to have that kind of thought so that you can investigate later and see exactly where the mistake was being made. That doesn't mean you fight with somebody else about it. You just check on these things for yourself. I have a lot of students now that are starting to teach, which is great. I try to encourage all of my students when they, when they are practicing and being a teacher, that they use the suttas. Now, some, some students, they use the suttas just a little tiny bit. And then they go on with their thoughts and opinions and that sort of thing. And they start talking about ways that the practices help them in one way or another. I can't judge that. I can't say, no, you have to follow the way that I do it. I have to allow people the freedom to be able to express the Dhamma as long as they're using smiling and the six R's. That's the only requirement of being a teacher for, for what we're doing here. The reason that I started reading the suttas in the first place was because when I started doing this, it was in 1995, and Bhikkhu Bodhi had just uh, released his copy of the Majjhima Nikaya. Now the books that I was using before that, that was a Pali Text Society, they, they used old English and they used phrases that were hard to understand and it didn't, it didn't feel right. But when Bhikkhu Bodhi's book came out, I got real excited because it's more update information. It was still the suttas, but because of the change of language and the style, it was much easier to understand. Now, my whole life, I have had dyslexia. Dyslexia is a learning deficiency, they call it. My brain doesn't translate the written word, and uh, it doesn't translate so easily in my brain. And I had trouble reading, and I had trouble writing, because when I would write, 
I always got B's and D's and other letters. They always got turned around, mixed up. So when I got a hold of Bhikkhu Bodhi's book, I thought, well, I want people to understand the Dhamma as well as it can be understood. And because I had trouble reading, what I wanted to do was get more practice at reading and reading out loud. I can read to myself, that's no problem. But when I read out loud, sometimes the words jump around. Sometimes things get a little jumbled up. So when I started, and I'd, I'd been teaching for about 20 years at that point. And when I started reading the suttas to the students, I saw their progress in the meditation take off. I mean, it was amazing. All of a sudden, they were experiencing a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, clarity of mind, a lot of equanimity. Because I was reading the words of the Buddha the translation of Bhikkhu Bodhi's words. And as I started seeing a lot of people being more successful, rather than me just going off and talking about this or that, then I could add in some of my commentary whenever it seemed appropriate. I became a very successful teacher. So when my students take off and they want to teach, I strongly suggest that they read from the suttas. Not many of them do, because everybody has their own style and they, want, they have their own message they want to put in with it. But None of my students are as successful at teaching meditation as I am. Because I stick to the suttas. One of the things that the suttas are renowned for is being systematic. So you go through a lot of different things that the Buddha is talking about with each sutta. But it's done in such a systematic way that by the end of the Dhamma talk, everybody that listens to it, they have good understanding. And that along with some commentary is the way that I would like all of my students to teach. not following necessarily my commentary, but they can make their own commentary. But it keeps things systematic. It keeps things flowing. And you start out slowly and you start building. Just like this sutta here. It started out with two people not agreeing with what they said the Buddha said. Now the Buddha steps in and he starts saying, well, I've taught that, I've taught this. And they're both right. But I've also taught five of these and six of these and 18 of those and 36 of these. He taught a lot of different ways. One way is no more correct than the other. That's one of the things that makes the Buddha such a remarkable teacher because he taught this way for uh, 45 years. He changed some of the things he was uh, teaching, but the only way he changed was in the explanation of the same thing. So the point I'm trying to get across is 
if you want to teach, you must be successful in the meditation yourself to start off with. The thing that's, that's really amazing is when I first went to be with K. Sri Dhammananda and he was having me give talks every other week. And over a period of a, a, a few months, whenever I was giving a talk, I would go in and I would start reading a sutta and discussing what the sutta was talking about. And the number of people that I saw listening very intentively, attentively, excuse me, were starting to shake their head every time I, they heard something that they thought was right. And it's really nice when you're in an audience of 300 or 400 people to see quite a few people shaking their head. It really gives a lot of confidence in giving a Dhamma talk. Anyway, I'm going to get back to the sutta now. Okay, I have stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. 18 kinds of feeling, past, pleasant, and future of the six kinds of feeling. See how they're interconnected. And it goes on to say 36 kinds, and then it goes on to say 108 kinds of feeling. Now, a lot of people think that this has something to do with the Abhidhamma, because it's always the, the, the list of uh, things. There's 52 of this, there's 108 of that. There's all these different numbers that they use the mnemonic system with Abhidhamma as a means of memorizing and keeping things straight. So when the Abhidhamma talks about 52 different kinds of feeling, it's all these emotional things. And it breaks down to pleasant and unpleasant. So you can see how it's always consistent and always intertwined. There are some suttas in that are written as in, in the Majjhima Nikaya, there's a, a few of them that aren't in the original discourses. One of them is Sutta number 20. Sutta number 20 talks about different ways of overcoming hindrances, which is taken from the Vedas, not from the Buddha's teaching. Now I say taken from the Vedas, I mean some of the Vedas, not all of them. And when it gets down to the fifth different kind of way that you treat a hindrance, it says to push your tongue against the roof of your mouth, grit your teeth, and crush mind with mind. Now this sutta is taken from commentary. 
And it's also taken from another sutta where they just copied part of the sutta and put that in and they didn't teach the whole sutta, which can cause real misunderstanding. Because in Sutta number 36, this is about the Buddha and his experience with meditation and the different things that he tried to overcome hindrances. He said that this, he would work with that so much, trying to push down and suppress the hindrance from coming up that he would have sweat coming from his armpits and he would get very tired physically because he was trying so hard. Now they don't put that part in the Sutta number 20. And Sutta number 20 is very, very misleading. And there are a lot of people even today that are doing the different kinds of meditation, the <coughs> mindfulness of the body, the, the vipassana kind, some vipassanas kinds of meditation where you're trying to suppress. Now the way that this sutta is a mistake is that it doesn't take into account the Noble Eightfold Path. And it doesn't take that into account at all. It's trying to note something until it goes away and then immediately come back to your object of meditation, which is either the breath or the body, whatever it happened to be. If you immediately come back to your object of meditation after allowing something to be or that it disappears and you don't use the relaxed step, you are practicing a different form of meditation than what the Buddha was teaching. A lot of people, they do yoga, they do meditation, but they don't have the relaxed step in it. A lot of people come here and they, they say, well, can I do my yoga? And I say, I don't care whether you do yoga or not. I don't care whether you exercise or not. That's up to you. The only thing I want you to do is smile and relax your mind and use the six R's. Any kind of distraction, I don't care what sense door it's at. You don't make it into a big deal. You don't keep your mind on it and then try to analyze it and, and figure out why this is a problem. Right effort says that you immediately let it be by itself. Don't make a big deal out of anything. Allow it to be, relax, smile, lighten your mind. Now, when people start doing yoga the way that I'm, I'm suggesting with the six R's and the smile, they come back and they tell me, oh, the yoga is much better now. I'm much more limber than I was because I'm not trying to push and, and experience the things the way I think they should be experiencing them. My mind and my perspective is different now. 
So even doing yoga is fine if you do it in the right way. If you do it according to right effort. If you're taught that, oh, I'm being mindful and I'm noting, 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 and I'm mindful when I do that. By their definition of mindfulness, yes, that might be true, but that is not necessarily the definition that the Buddha was talking about. So it's a real necessary part of this practice for you to notice the feeling when it first starts to come up and know what to do when it arises. Now, some people, when they come and they start practicing here, they kind of complain because everything is too easy. It's too simple. And the reason that it's simple is you're not getting caught in the clinging and the habitual tendencies, like your mind always gets caught. And that helps change your perspective, which helps change your attitude towards life. The more equanimity, the more balance you have in your life, the easier life becomes the more fun life becomes. And the more you affect the world around you in a positive way. This is part of the goal of the Buddha and his teaching. The ultimate end of the goal is getting off of the wheel of sansara, so you don't have to put up with this nonsense anymore. You don't have to put up with how much pain you cause yourself because of wrong view. This is me, this is mine, this is who I am, and I'm right and you're wrong. No. more balance, more acceptance. And the more you talk about acceptance, the more you talk about forgiveness. An awful lot of people have this idea that I can forgive something one time and I'm done with it. Oh, I forgave that. But you still have the emotional hold on it you still have that emotional attachment to it. So whatever you quote forgave keeps coming up. And the more it comes up, the more pain you are causing yourself. So when you forgive, we've spent a lot of time in changing some of the wording in the forgiveness meditation. Found that a lot of people were becoming confused when I say, well, six are that. So we don't have the six R's in, well, we have it in, in the forgiveness, but we have it in a different way. You spend time forgiving yourself for not understanding, for causing yourself pain. Any thought, any distraction that arises, you forgive that right then. You forgive that thought for distracting you. You forgive the sensation for distracting you, whatever it happens to be. Then you relax and bring that relaxed mind back to forgiving yourself again. So I used to say you use the six R's. 
but that was misleading for a lot of people. Now I just say relax. Relax that tension and tightness in your head caused by the distraction. When you forgive the distraction completely, there will be a sense of relief. And you'll know that you don't have to forgive anymore, right? How about that? An awful lot of people, especially these days, need forgiveness meditation. Now, we give forgiveness meditations online because of this virus nonsense. We don't have people coming to the center, so I can help you personally. But David is setting it up with a lot of different helpers that understand forgiveness very well. And they would be able to help you to do it online. There's questions they're going to ask you. Some of those questions you need to answer and a lot of the things that we feel guilty about that we need to forgive in ourself is things that we did and we don't want anybody else to know. In other words, you're keeping a secret. Now, a definition of an arahat is an individual that has no secrets. Now let's explain again how a hindrance arises. Something happens and you have a negative reaction to it and you take it personally. You told a lie. You, you use foul language. You did gossip, which is making up stories about other people. As soon as you did that, in your mind, your mind says, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. And you feel guilty. You feel a little bit of remorse. And then you shine it on and you get involved in other activities and forget that you did it. So when you start doing your forgiveness meditation, these kind of memories will come up again because they have this false idea of a personal self involved with it. So you forgive over and over again until you convince your mind that you really do forgive. And you don't need to hold on to that old pain that has been following you your whole life. David just had his phone go off. So forgiveness is a lot of acceptance. So another situation comes up that's similar to what you experienced before. You won't have the old reaction occurring. because you've let go of that attachment. You've let go of that old guilty feeling and you feel a lot lighter and your mind is much more clear and alert and awake. So some people, they say, well, I forgave that and clearly they didn't forgive it. 
Now, what my job is, or David's job, or whoever is teaching this to other people, is to get you to continue forgiving it until it actually comes up. And you might say something to the teacher about, well, one time I did this and I made a mistake. Then it's no longer a secret because you told somebody else. And when you tell somebody else about something that you did, it was dumb. And you did it because you didn't understand the whole situation and you tried to deceive the world around you with your words. But when you let go of that, it's not a secret anymore when you say, yeah, I did that. And I, I see that it was a, a wrong thing to do and I wish I hadn't have done it, but this is part of the learning experience. This is how you become more awake, more alert. And happier. You do this by letting go of the old habitual tendencies. Now trying to keep a secret all the time makes you break other precepts just so you can reinforce your secret. And you can see how it affects not only you, but it affects everybody else around you. Now, I've been in some cultures where not telling the truth, they have the belief that that's not telling a lie. And that's, especially in Asia, little white lies are acceptable. But little white lies are lies. They're not telling the truth of what you actually think or see or do. And that causes a lot of identification and suffering in yourself. Now, there can be some major things that happen in your life. Uh, verbal fighting or physical fighting or whatever it happened to be, but you tried to keep it a secret. And keeping that secret causes you to see the world in a different way because you're keeping that secret. So you need to let go of the secrets. Sometimes it's very difficult. I remember this one lady, she came to a teacher that I was studying with at the time. And she sat down and she said, I've been doing something for a long time and I really feel guilty. And of course the teacher said, oh, what was that? And she kind of hemmed and hawed around. And then she said, I'd like to gamble. And I have been gambling my money away. And as soon as she said that to him, she let go of that attachment to it. And you could see her face all of a sudden become bright where it was kind of cloudy before, it was kind of muddly. So letting go of your secrets is what forgiveness is all about. Letting go of the pain that you had in the past that you're trying to not let anybody else know that you had that experience or that you did this or that, whatever it happens to be.
Forgiveness takes away pain and suffering. So when you are forgiving yourself for not understanding, a lot of people come in and they say, I don't understand. I don't understand what I'm supposed to uh, understand. And well, no. You made a mistake in the past. You didn't understand the consequences of that, of even a little white lie. You didn't understand the consequences of that coming back to you and causing you suffering. So that's what you don't understand. And when you, you tell uh, other people that come up in your mind from past experience that they didn't understand, well, they didn't understand the whole situation. They didn't understand what it was that caused this problem. So you forgive them for not understanding. You forgive them for making a mistake. Even if it's a, a, a physical punishment kind of mistake, you can forgive that. The whole point of doing this meditation is learning how craving arises, what craving actually is and how to let it go. Now we have different remedies for different things, but they all turn out to be the same thing. It all comes back to using the six R's. If you use the six R's with a relax of your tension and tightness in your head and your mind, you're using the six R's. If you use the six R's by being able to recognize distraction and forgive the distraction for coming up, and you don't have to start thinking about the cause of the distraction, just forgive it for being there. The cause and the effect will happen all on its own as you continue opening up and letting go of your secrets. So now I see that it's been for an hour that I've been here. Do you have any questions? Uh, Anyone? Everything I said was so clear that you understand it and you don't have a question about it? Hello, Bhante. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, How are been, you? Yeah, I am fine. It's been quite a long time. I'm in Asian time, so was not able to attend. You're going to have to speak up a little bit. I can't hear you as well as I could. Yeah. Uh, it's been very long time. Uh, I'm very fine. I have two questions, Bante. Okay. Uh, my first question. Um, uh, if Is it possible that somebody gets experienced cessation but does not uh, see the Nibbana. Does not what? Does not experience Nibbana. Well, there's a, a lot of misunderstanding about things. Sometimes the, somebody can have an experience of opening up and they feel real happy for a short period of time. But that's not necessarily 
the Nibbana experience. They had a letting go of something. But the way you understand having the experience of Nibbana is test it on yourself if you can say something that's not true like uh, this book is pink and you see that it's actually red or that it's actually green if you say something that's not true like that, you will have a guilty feeling arise. If you have the guilty feeling arise, that means that you broke the precept and your pure mind that had experienced Nibbana is real. But sometimes you can have an experience where there's a, just an opening up and you walk around feeling happy for a long time. That's happened to me a few times. And I had some delusions that maybe this was the experience of Nibbana, but it wasn't. It wore off after a period of time. It's like you got used to letting go of whatever it was you let go of. And now you're so used to it that it's no big deal. But always, when you test with the, uh, the precepts, that's the way you really find out whether it's real or not, is with, with a guilty feeling. Okay? Uh, Bante, I have one other question. Okay? Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. I understood. I will go for my next question. Okay. Uh, can I can I say something like this? Like uh, in the links of dependent origination, uh, when there is craving, uh, there is feeling. There is um, feeling also exist at that point of time. Similarly, like when there is feeling. Uh, yes. Uh, the, see, the thing is, as you, as you go deeper and deeper, the feeling can become more and more subtle. And you don't notice it like you did when you bang your foot or, or you stub your toe or whatever. It's not big like that. But as you quiet down, feeling always starts with a disturbance of mind and it can be very subtle but as soon as you notice the feeling then the craving is there the i like it i don't like it and you you feel that tension and tightness and it, when you use the six r's of course it it will let go of that tension and tightness and mind becomes more clear then you have to continue on with the six r's with smiling and coming back to your object but there are a lot of false beliefs in a nibbana experience and there's a lot of different definitions of what nibbana is And that causes people to walk around with their chest puffed up and I'm a soda pana. Well, I hope you're right. I'm not one to say whether it is right or not. But I might ask you a few questions. If, if you experience true Nibbana, your perspective of the things that you see around you changes. Things become more clear, colors become more bright. Your understanding becomes more and more set with equanimity. Doesn't mean you won't have a, uh, 
an emotional upset in one way or another ever. But as you go along and go deeper and deeper and have more than one experience of Nibbana, your perspective is going to change and the way you see everybody around you, you become more accepting and life becomes easier. Okay? Did that answer that for you? Yes, Bhante. Okay. Bhante. Yes. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Very good. I love it here in American Samoa. And my request or uh, thought is I'm, uh, I think you ought to consider coming here to, a, to uh, do a retreat. <laughs> well, there's no COVID here. The people fought, fought, fought excuse me, to smile all the time. It's the easiest place I know to keeping your precepts. It's wonderful here. And I just want to bring it to your attention. Oh, thank you. But I'm starting to feel the effects of traveling quite a bit. Yep. And I still might travel, but it's going to be a while. Okay. Well, we whatever. Things first. Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. Well, welcome. Hey, Al. I'm uh, booking my ticket right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's one. It's wonder. The t it's eight eighty-five. The weather is incredible, and uh, I'm sure you enjoy it. We'll enjoy it. Well, yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> That's why I went to Asia all the time in the winter time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bante, thank you for your talk. I have a quick question. You said earlier, if your students wanted to teach, that they have to be successful in their meditation. Yes. How do you define that? How would you know if one of your students is successful in their meditation? Like, what does that, like every day, or they never skip a day? Like, what, what does no, that look like? No, it's not, it's not like that. It's their understanding of the Dhamma and being able to experience Nibbana. Do you understand what I mean by that? I, I feel like there's two ways to understand the experience Nibbana. There are like what you have talked before about mini Nibbanas, where we relieve, where we uh, free ourselves from craving. I'm, and talking then the, I'm, the super mundane. I'm talking about the super mundane. Ah, the... Um, the Rupa Janas have experienced the Rupa Janas? Of course. And become Satipana. Is being Satipana necessary to be a teacher? Not absolutely necessary, but your understanding has to be very, very deep. Hmm. See, you have to be able to experience something before you can give that, it, that knowledge to other people. And a lot of people try to fake their way through and they get muddled and they get, uh, they get frustrated very easily and then wind up quitting. But when you have a direct experience, then the answers that you give are going to be closer to the accu accurate real experience. Okay? Thank you. And one of the things that we started doing for the teachers is we started sending out certificates of merit. Thank you, Bante. I'm not sure whether whether that's uh, 
a good idea or not, but we started doing it anyway. <laughs> I, I had the idea that every time somebody would come to meditate, if they got to a jhana, I would give them a certificate for getting to that jhana. And then you go all the way through and the last certificate I give you is a blank piece of paper. How about how about a, a punch card? <laughs> Congratulations! During during the interview, you get your card punched. <laughs> The more you can be happy, the more you have a lighter mind with your daily activities, the easier it is to help other people to attain that because you have the direct experience. I run across an awful lot of people that they just read books. And if you read the Dhamma books now, there's an awful lot of them that are misdirecting. But they'll read all of these different books and they say, well, I'm qualified to teach. When I first came back to this country and I started teaching, I wouldn't let anybody read any books for a period of time. You want to read something? Go read the suttas. You want to listen to something? Go listen to my Dhamma talks. And after a period of time, then I would start giving little pamphlets to read, little books to read, and then the, the, the amount of books gets to be more and more until you feel comfortable with being able to express that. People think that being a teacher is real special and it's real easy and it's not. Some of the suttas that you hear me give, I've given those 50 or 75 or 100 times. And you have to do it with the same confidence. You have to do it with the same kind of enthusiasm. I know this stuff works and I want to show you how it works. So you have to repeat yourself many, 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 many times without getting frustrated by it. Some of my students, I've had them, they listen to what I say and they might hear me say something a hundred or two hundred or three hundred times. And then they have the experience and they come and they there it's like this is brand new to them wow it's just like this yeah right <laughs> and if you had listened to what i said the first time you would have experienced it oh well but that's part of being a teacher and then being enthusiastic when they are successful, being truly happy for them. A lot of the students that come here, I, I am truly happy and excited for them because I see that their mind is opening up. Their, their mind is more clear, their mind is more bright. And that really makes me happy. That shows me that what I'm, what I'm trying to get across is working. 
Okay. Any other question? Hi, Bonte. Hi, Bonte. Hello. Oh, Helen, you go first. Oh, sorry. Uh, should I go first? Uh, yeah. That's no, fine. I want to thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the uh, for your talks and also for the support group. I do really experiences in the last like four months or five months about like like following you on uh, these talks, which uh -huh. you actually was delivering what the open mind. So I just want to share my um, first share my like um, like the happiness, the joy that I have been through with this uh, this talks and this practice is with uh, especially now I have a a, a, a supported team uh, with Kim uh, so I will be um, I'll be joining the uh, the retreat soon but um, on today's talk I have a uh, question because there is a late experience of mine regarding of letting go or not analyzing our like uh, uh, a feeling come up um, because like I have an experience that I have this uh, reaction, which is also an emotional feeling that comes up and it leads me to see how and why it was like coming up. So the, um, the analyzing part, um, whether it should be doing it or not, how can we balance it? Because if I don't analyze it, I was not able to see deep through what was arising it, but from the seeing of what has given the arising uh, of that particular reaction, which is not a response, it's giving me understanding of my previous um, perception, wrong perception or incepted thing. But that at that point, I saw it also caused a guilt feeling already there. So, um, but I have an understanding. I want to know, how to balance between not analyzing or contemplating the the root like how do, how should we balance that because if i i contemplate i understand how was rooting out but from the rooting i see myself in guilt feeling so how would you advise for whether we should let go of the analysis part or going to a deeper contemplation of understanding the roots. You understand what analysis is? Uh, it's the thoughts, which I don't like, which is a no, lot of not, thinking and thoughts. That that like. It's the through. thinking that right? about. Listen to what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Okay, you've okay. talked a long time. I've listened to you. I want to give you the answer, but you can't talk when I'm talking. Understand analyzing is sitting and thinking and trying to figure out why. Okay. That means you're not feeling at that time. So how do you, how do, you don't have to feel guilty about it. Your mind is just thinking. And sometimes you have to verbalize some of your experience <clears throat> but not over and over and over and over and over again. Now, you have a feeling of joy arise, okay? And then your mind says, I feel this joy. Okay, fine. That's not analyzing. That's just observing and verbalizing what you observed in your mind. But when you start thinking, why did it come up? Then how did it come up? And that's analyzing. That gets in your way. Six are that. Go back to just feeling that. Why it came up doesn't matter. Does it? How it came up? Well, because you were purifying your mind with the six R's and it caused joy to arise. That's it. It's simple. You don't have to try to think about how it happened, why it happened, what can I do so that I can have it happen again. You don't want to get caught in that. 
stay with the feeling as long as it's there, be happy that the feeling was there. You might have some thoughts in the future about that, but they're just going to come up as thoughts. And you can take them as yours or not. It's up to you. But do you, do you see what I'm getting at? It's, yes, it's yes. not overthinking again and again and again and again and again. That's analyzing. Mm. It's not the joy feeling. It's about like sometimes I have this... Um, uh, a subtle uh, sad feelings. That is what it is like, or a um, sad feeling, wholesome or unwholesome. Is that an unwholesome feeling? Yeah. Oh, what do you do with unwholesome feeling? Recognize it, relax it, release it, relax it. <laughs> Okay, but it's and it's, smile. It's yeah. tell it's telling you something. It's telling. But it's you telling me something. Yeah. That's my my question. Yeah, it's it's telling me something. So should no. I go on asking my? No, you don't go on asking anything. Hmm. It's telling you that you have an attachment and you're not willing to let it go. That's why it keeps coming back. So you six are it and stop making a big deal out of it. The more you make a big deal out of it, the more suffering you cause yourself. Thank you, Lightly. I think, yeah, I, laugh, I got it. Laugh more. Okay, so Thank your, you. your face just lightened up a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes me happy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Bonte. Hi. How are you? I'm doing really well, Monty. How are you? You're doing good. Thanks. <laughs> You're a little blurry, but that's oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so my uh, uh, my question is this. So in my sitting practices lately, I've been, I'm noticing that, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I've been noticing that I've, uh, I'm now able to stay with the, the meta for longer. Um, and, uh, so I'll notice that like, even though I'm with the feeling of meta, I'll notice that there's tension building up in my mind, even though I'm still with the meta. So okay. is it, is it correct? Pre is it a correct, is it right effort to relax that tension as I'm noticing it, even though I'm still with the meta or should I just, just not worry about it? Stay with the meta. Don't worry about it. Only when your mind goes away from the metta, then you use the six R's. Mm. And that will let go of the tension. But just ignore it until your mind is completely distracted. Mm. Okay. So don't make a big deal out of it in your mind. Stay mm, okay. with, staying with the metta and your object of meditation is most important. Mm. Okay. So until I'm distracted, just don't worry about it. Right. If it doesn't really distract you, it's nothing. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. It most <laughs> always is. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Ante. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sort of new to the group, um, but thank you very much for your arousing and inspirational talk on the Dharma. Thank um, 
uh, I suppose about the topic that was previously discussed about attainment and Nibbana. Um, I remember a while back, I, I had an experience that for me at least um, was very, very life changing when doing the practice. Um, and for a while afterwards, I remember that I would uh, ruminate and wonder, oh, have I experienced Nirvana? Have I not experienced Nirvana? Do I, <laughs> all this sort of stuff until I realized, you know what, that's just all nonsense stuff. Good for you. You know, I, <laughs> and it just got so much more peaceful afterwards when I think, you know, it doesn't matter. What matters is, um, am I treating people better? Am I right. uh, actually dealing with the real problem, which is when I'm reacting to what other people say that I didn't like? And, you know, these sort of things, that, that's, that's the measure, I think, when the Buddha the Buddha always talked about the, the practical sense, I think, the sense that um, uh, am I uh, letting go of that which needs to be let go of and cultivating the that which leads to greater tranquility? Yeah. Um, well, uh, test yourself. <laughs> yeah. And odd, oh, didn't, didn't I? I well, like, um, yeah. You know, this is all about self exploration and self discovery. Mm. When you feel naturally more at ease with people that you didn't used to be at ease with, mm. and you feel your mind stay light, that is a really good sign. And the more you practice your daily activities with the loving kindness of radiating a happy feeling, radiating a smile in your mind, in your eyes, in your, with your mouth, just a little one. And you start to make that a habit, it turns into a kind of protection for you so that you'll be more aware of what you're going to do before you do it. Yeah, it's so, it's so true. It is so true. Um, I think that was one of the biggest things for me was when I had, when I started doing the practice and I had that experience and I started really taking the precepts really seriously, just seeing how much simpler things become, how much, <laughs> how much nonsense gets sort of cut out, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is good. Good. It makes me happy to know that you're doing so well. Thank you. <laughs> if I can help you in any other way, please let me know. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have a question, statement? Hello, Bhante. Hello. How are uh, you? Hello, How are you? Are you in India? Yes, I'm in India. Where? In Mumbai. In Mumbai. Ah. You know, Sister Kema is in Mumbai. Oh, okay. So, so I, I first, so I first had a question, and then I got to know that I just had to smile more, and that was one of the answers. So, I'll get to the next question. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Everything so, is fine. Okay. So the next question which I wanted to ask was. Um, when we say that we have to understand how the mind is moving, so do I consciously try to trace back how the mind moved after the six hours? Oh, you consciously stay with your object of meditation. Then okay. you'll to see more and more clearly as you go deeper, you'll see more and more clearly how mind's attention goes away. So I should put more energy into observing the object of meditation. Put more energy into smiling and being happy and okay. wishing that happiness to your friend. Okay. okay. 
And when you're walking down the street, smile at everybody around you and wish them well. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, let's share some merit now. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bande. Thank you, Bande. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>